Right. Uh, this is a diagram that most of us have probably seen uh, wherever we've looked up uh, bladder micturition and receptors involved because this was uh, from the nature and it's prob probably the most used diagram. Now, um, uh, on this diagram, um, the three peripheral nerves which are um, involved, namely the parasympathetic uh, pathways, the sympathetic pathways, as well as the somatic or uh, to dental nerve pathway are involved. Now, all that we need to really remember here from, uh, because these are some nitty gritties that we do come across MCQs once in a while, is that the level of the parasympathetic uh, pathways uh, arise from the sacral spinal cord, S2 to S4. Absolutely need to know this. There is a sacral parasympathetic nucleus, very easy to remember. The nerve involved is the pelvic nerve. The neurotransmitter, as you can see from the diagram, is acetylcholine and um, the receptors uh, that it acts on preganglionically are nicotinic but on the bladder are muscarinic that is it you probably know all of this now the next um, the nerve below it the sympathetic pathway the levels are t10 to l2 uh, the nucleus involved is the interomedial in mediolateral nuclei there are two nerves actually um, hypogastric nerve predominantly, but sympathetics also travel through the pelvic nerve. So the pelvic nerve thereby conducts both sympathetic and parasympathetic pathways. Or just like and just like the previous parasympathetic pathways, all pre or all preganglionic neurotransmission is mediated via acetylcholine. Postganglionic uh, is adrenergic, so noradrenaline, and primarily the role was um, in keeping the keeping the tone of the outlet uh, where, where, where you see the urethra and the alpha-1 receptors, but later on it was found that beta-3 receptors have quite a role and hence uh, the role of beta-3 adrenergic agonists that we use, uh, namely Myra Vigron. And the preganglionic receptors, as always, is nicotinic and postganglionic, as we said, is adrenergic. And the third and the last player of the peripheral nervous system is the somatics, which also arise from the same level. The onus nucleus is involved and the nerve is pudendal. And uh, for the AQ trainees who uh, appeared in the exam, uh, in, in, in the internal exam today, uh, the nerve involved uh, for, for, the, for the function of the external urethral sphincter is the pudendal nerve. Neurotransmitter again, acetylcholine, preganglionic pre again, nicotinic and postganglionic, nicotinic. So this is it uh, for all that is happening at the level of the bladder. Now, this is the simple part of it. And most of us already knew all of this. Now comes the role of the afferent fibers. Now, afferent fibers are basically the fibers which are taking the input from the bladder to the higher up authorities, be it the spinal cord or be it the uh, center, the center, central nervous system. The most important of these fibers are the A delta fibers. Now, A delta fibers are always active. You and I and everyone else with a normal bladder are sitting with some influx of urine coming into the bladder. And the A delta fibers are responding to this passive dilation. Uh, passive distension of the bladder and uh, or, or in other words bladder filling now these are myelinated fibers and they have a low activation threshold so they tend to start firing as soon as there is some uh, filling of the bladder and then they come the c fibers now the c fibers are involved in special situations they respond to chemical irritation and cold and they usually unmyelinated and they have a high threshold high activation threshold so also referred to as sarin fibers however when we're talking about talking about chemical irritation when we're talking about cold, when we see our patients getting bladder spasms, these are the fibers which are fi uh, firing at that time. Now, from these afferent fibers, just as I said, there is continuous input to higher up authorities, the periaqueductal gray matter and the pontine maturation center in the brain stem. And we will see just in a minute what their role is. Now, primarily, if you just think about it, um, there's just two things happening. The bladder is either filling or the bladder is either empty, right? So bladder filling or storage, how does that happen? Let's just take a look. Now, and keep in mind, bear in mind, uh, the functions that we were talking about, if you remember the first diagram, there's the detrusor and there is the outlet. This is where the antagonism comes. The true, the, when the filling is taking place, the detrusor obviously has to relax, but at the same time, it is as important for the outflow to be contracted and hence the antagonism between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic pathways. So this antagonism 
Now it is beautiful because we do not have medications that can target both of these um, pathways at the same time. However, the innate or the built-in mechanism that we have in the body, such as the PMC and the periaqueductal gray that we just talked about, control at the same time these descending pathways. Let's see how. Now, bladder filling. We talked about the activation of A-delta fibers. And these fibers then take input to the sympathetic fibers. What did we say? The level of the lumbar cord. What the sympathetic fibers do, in addition to their effect on the bladder, they also have an inhibitory effect on the parasympathetic nervous system. So parasympathetic, remember P for parasympathetic, P for peeing. We don't want that to happen when we are storing or when we're filling. So the, the sympathetic fibers, they're going to decrease the parasympathetic input and they're going to send noradrenergic input to the beta-3, uh, thereby the agonist effect of relaxation. And as we said, it is extremely important for the outlet to be contracted at the level of the urethra. And all of this, what it essentially results is, it results in is storage of urine and inhibition of maturation. This very simplified diagram is what is referred to as the vesico, starting from the bladder, spinal taking place in the lumbar cord, vesicle ending up back in the bladder, reflex. I hope that is clear. So now with bladder filling, I mean, there has to be a point when it stops, right? We cannot go on storing urine forever. So there has to be something that is regulating till what time is this um, acceptable? And at what time does this have to stop? And at what time do we have to shift to bladder emptying, also known as maturation? Now, we've already talked about the afferent activity to higher spinal cord and brain, which is basically the periaqueductal gray and the pontine maturation center in the brain stem. These centers are what have control over the descending parasympathetic pathways. But it's not that simple. They are also getting input from the cortex and hypothalamus. And this is where our learned behaviors come into play. Our emotions come into play. How we know where we have to avoid the appropriateness of maturation. This is why we have learned all our lives to not just go pee in the middle of a room. So this all is actually linked to all of this system in the periaqueductal gray and the pontine maturation center in the brainstem, which control the descending pathways. So now that in the descending pathways, obviously because they want to pee, so they're going to activate the P or the parasympathetic and the parasympathetic activity through its action on the detrusor, through the receptors that we just saw, are eventually going to lead to maturation. So at the same time, this is how they work. When the And this is why the pontine maturation center is also referred to as the switch, the on and off switch. Now we don't want to pee, that's that's fairly simple you decrease your input to the descending pathways or you inhibit the descending pathways and then thereby decreasing the parasympathetic sympathetic activity and letting sympathetic activity take precedence so this is fairly what maturation is all about and i hope this was very clear i've kept it very short because a better understanding of it can arise from clinical correlates and we are thankful that we uh, I'm being followed by Dr. Nazim, who is going to take over and talk about all that can go wrong, unfortunately, with all of this circuitry. So over to Dr. Nazim. Thank you very much for your time. And um, if you people have any questions, you can mention them in the chat box, but I'm sure they will probably be addressed uh, somewhere in Dr. Nazim's talk. So thank you, everyone, once again for your time. And over to Dr. Right. Thank you, Ahmed. I think these are uh, uh, this is a very short, brief, and lucid presentation. These are essentially very important uh, concepts to understand the lower urinary tract symptoms, the dynamics between somatic and the uh, autonomic nervous system, and the various components of autonomic nervous system, i.e. the uh, parasympathetic interplay between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system not only for the working of the lower unit tract, but also for erectile function. So uh, we can have lesions anywhere from the uh, peripheral nerves to central nervous system, and in the central nervous system, the spinal cord, as well as going all the way up to the, the brain. Uh, 